Welcome back to week seven of Striper Season Updates with On The Water. I'm Matt Hefner, and over the next seven weeks, we'll be bouncing around the coast, following different local bites as the bass migrate north. We'll talk to all sorts of credible striper fishing sources from Jersey to Maine to give you the scoop on how the bite changes over the coming months. Last week, I was joined by Dustin Stevens, a kayak angling guide and owner of Rhode Island Kayak Fishing Adventures. Dustin and I spoke about holdover bass and how the bite has changed since April 1st, before reviewing his tactics, favorite baits, kayak safety gear, and how to set up a user-friendly striper fishing kayak. Stripers are moving further up the northeast coast with each passing day, and so far, the spring has been one for the books. Reports from southern New Jersey to Cape Cod have slot-sized fish feeding aggressively around everything from bunker pods in the surf to schools of spearing and squid in the back bays. This week, I'm heading back to my neck of the woods. We're leaving New England and skipping across the Long Island Sound to speak with a true fishing legend. My guest this week is an icon in surf casting. He spends his free time scuba diving and bucktailing the north and south shores of Long Island. He's a renowned author, YouTuber, and virtual mentor to thousands and thousands of anglers worldwide. Please welcome Mr. John Skinner. I wanted to say thank you for joining, John. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you this week because uh, I, you know, as a Long Islander, it's I've been watching your videos for years, and to to learn this much from you and to actually finally get to speak to you firsthand now is actually a pleasure. So thanks for joining the show. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. So you just got back from Florida. Um, you know what what have you noticed about the migration so far, and uh, and and what's your favorite go to striper fishing lure? Even though I kind of have an idea of what you're going to say, you know, when you first yeah, you know what I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it starts with a B, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I mean, look, I you know, you drive two full days, you know, it's like oh, about 24 hours of driving, and then roll in, and you know, I, I kind of want to get out the next morning, and and I did, and I was shocked that, uh, geez, when you start like that, you First of all, you're real tired and you have no idea what's going on. And then lo and behold, uh, first 13 casts, I, I got 12 fish. And and the cast I didn't get one, I set the uh, hook into the strip. So I just couldn't quite hook it. And yeah, it was a great morning. Um, but, you know, I went back the following morning and it was really slow. Same spot, same tide, basically, and, and everything. Um, so really, I and then, so that was like, you know, Thursday, Friday or something. And then the, the big winds came up that, you know, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, too. I mean, it's still blowing. This is, you know, it's still blowing this morning. So basically, um, I, I fished, you know, I fished those first couple of mornings and even got out in the boat and then the wind hit. And at that point, then I, I started unpacking because I, I hadn't even <laughs> unpacked or anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, got lots to do. Yeah. The move back and forth. It's it's a lot of work on both ends, but in the middle, it's wonderful you know, to yeah you know be in these places absolutely yeah they're two two amazing places so i was going to say you you're situated somewhere along the south uh the north shore of long island rather is that correct right i'm on the almost the tip of the north fork i live in greenport awesome yeah i spent a ton of time out there as a kid so that's actually where i learned to grow up fishing so uh the plum gut and the greenport area south hold bay and all that hold a very special uh near and dear place to my heart. But, you know, with all the wind out there recently blowing out of, I think it's out of the Northeast, it's been the same way here on the Cape. So you must be getting just crushed, clobbered on the North Shore of Long Island. So do you find that that wind ever inhibits the bite or does it actually push the fish, the fish closer to shore uh, when the tide is coming in particularly? Well, you know, hey, it's a really interesting thing is, you know, if you look at Long Island and you look at uh, how it's oriented and you look at how the fork curves to the north, like, you know, I grew up 28 years. I lived in Wading River, which is about 25 miles east of Greenport, uh, west of Greenport. And when you've got any kind of a, uh, an easterly wind there turns the water to mud, churns up, rips up the beach. Um, the, the, the water goes brown. It's a complete, absolute disaster. But 25 miles east to where I live now, and, you know, and I saw this yesterday, my wife and I walked up to the bluff and the water was clear as could be, because what happens is the way the fork curves out, it blocks the, the wind. The, the sound is only like eight miles wide here. And uh, so you don't have the big fetch to, to build the waves. And, um, you know, it ends up just it's fine. You know, it can blow east, northeast, even, you know, north to some extent real hard. And it doesn't tear up the beach. And it the water stays clean, but you know, I'm talking about the sound side now. And right now the sound temperature, I looked the other morning before it got really cold and it was only 49 degrees. And then we had a couple of nights, like 43 degrees, 45 degrees outside, you know, so certainly that water hasn't gotten any warmer this time of year. I don't focus really at all on the sound side. Um, 
so I stay on the bay side. But I know that water was kind of cold because um, when was it? I don't know. I guess it was like Friday morning. I took the boat out and I had it in the bay. And you know, when I got off the bay, it was like fifty three and a half. But that was before the cold came. So uh, it's you know, it's chilly. Yeah, it's, uh, I was going to say. So when that wind is blowing right off, right off of the sound into you, it's it's a little bit different than when the wind's blowing off on, right into the South Shore. Um, and I think the main reason for that is, you know, for people who aren't as familiar with the Long Island Sound or haven't fished the North Fork of Long Island, um, is that the environments are totally different from the North Shore to the South Shore. You got the North Shore, which is much more rocky, and then the South Shore, which um, is much more sandy and kind of shoaled out in a lot of ways, except for Montauk Point and a couple areas, of course. So could you talk a little bit about how those areas fish differently and and kind of, you know, I, I know you're a big user of bucktails. I've read your Fishing the Bucktail book. Um, so how the, you know, that influences what you throw and how the bucktail presentation or style will change from both shores. Well, one difference between the two environments is stability. I and mean, when you learn something on the North Shore, that that sticks um, because, look, those rocks aren't going anywhere. They're where they were a thousand years ago and a thousand years from now. They'll be in the same spots. And, you know, so all of that is exte- extremely stable structure as opposed to the South Shore. <laughs> things are changing all the time. So it's it's much harder to nail down uh, consistency on the South Shore, on, on the open beaches. Uh, in terms of bucktails, gee, you know, I'm, I'm throwing almost the same thing on both shores. I mean, pretty much the weight ranges are uh, three quarters of an ounce to an ounce and a half. And on the North Shore, obviously you've got the rocks you have to be concerned about. Funny thing is, I don't hesitate to throw bucktails into the rocky areas. Um, let me, I did get a cup. So, you know, when I'm on the North Shore, let's see how this shows up. Yeah, I'm holding it. All right. So I've got this, you know, look, it's got bulk, right? You know, the hair is, you know, fluffed out. It's got hackle feathers. So if you look, you know, down the middle, there's no hollow spot there. You know, that's where the hackle feathers are. So this bucktail is really filled out. And this is what I'll use on the North Shore in the rocky areas because it you can throw it out there, even if it's an ounce and a half, you can throw that out there and glide it over the rockiest, nastiest areas. Um, you've got current, um, but even if you only have a little bit of current, you can swim that bucktail above the, the rocky structure. And I, I, that's something where... You know, people often think, oh, I, I can't use a bucktail there. It's so rocky. But I rarely ever lose a bucktail on the bottom. And uh, I don't, I'm not careful. Well, why do I need to be careful, right? They'll send me more if I lose them. So I'm not careful at all. And I still never, ever, um, you know, almost never lose a bucktail on the bottom. And these were, so, you know, the standard um, smiling bill, but a lot goes into how much hair and then the, the hackles and everything else. So this is one of the uh, SNS and uh, Skinner bucktails. And where that came from is, you know, for years I tied my own. And then Stanley uh, at SNS started sending me some of his bucktails. And I said, hey, why can't you just make one of these? And he goes, well, I, I could do that. Uh, so that's where that came from. That's actually how my relationship with them started was like, me saying, well, why, why can't you make, because I hate tying them. I'm actually allergic to the deer hair. And I, you know, I work with the tails, you know, just, you know, cutting the hair off the tails. And, but I, I felt like I had to do it because that's the bucktail I wanted uh, for the North shore, for the inlets. And um, yeah, so that's, that's where that came from. Um, now on the South shore, that's still a good bucktail because you think about how deep is the water that you can't, well, you know, I know in the Cape, it's different, but on the South shore of Long Island, uh, the end of your cast with a bucktail, if you're hitting 12 feet, that's really deep. You know, most of the time you're hitting less water than that. So, yeah, that bucktail works fine for that as well because, again, you're swimming and gliding and just trying to stay off the bottom. The nice thing about the South Shore sandy bottom is that it's forgiving. You know, if you hit the bottom, yeah, no big deal. On the North Shore, yeah, you, you know, you could get hung up. But pretty much that bucktail is uh, a go-to on both beaches, uh, sound and ocean. Yeah. And I think that it, it, they, you know, they mimic such a wide variety of forage that that's part of the versatility of them. But like you were saying about the actual body of the bucktail, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, something you also mentioned in your book, Fish and the Bucktail is, is that deer hair is buoyant, right? It's hollow. So the more deer hair that's on it, the, it looks like it's going to be heavier and sink more, but it's actually going to add to that buoyancy. And if you add a trailer, 
Um, like I know we were talking about a little bit about gulp, like a grub style trailer. Um, those are actually buoyant as well. So that can add a little bit of extra weight, but also keep your lure a little bit more afloat. So this is a, a little, another smiling bill style bucktail um, tied by a guy. I, I actually don't know his name, but he goes by dead reckoning bucktails. He tied me some custom ones. Um, and this is one of my favorites that I have yet to even fish because I like looking at it so much. But it's that port wine kind of purple color. So I like to fish at night a lot. I asked him if he could tie something like that. Um, and, and it works great. Uh, I have another one that I've been fishing, but this one is, is just beautiful. So I've kind of kept it in the bag in pristine condition. But going back to the body of it, I wanted to ask you about a hackle. And, you know, do you find that if you have a long, extensive kind of hackle like that, do you find that it's overkill to have something like a jig strip or a trailer on there? No, I want that jig strip on there. Um, if that hackle is really long, it, it can interfere with that uh, with that strip. And I, I still would rather have the strip than the long hackles. Uh, that's, you know, that that's me. I realize, you know, you look at that in the water and it's got good action. But, um, you know, that strip has kind of special action on there. And, uh, yeah, I, I rather have a longer strip and, and sh slightly shorter hackles. Uh, on the same way. And so what I'm doing here is I'm actually pulling out just to kind of give people an idea of the, the jig strips you're talking about. This is a fat cow jig strip. It's just the, the kind that I use. Um, they're actually a local Long Island brand, so it's kind of cool. Um, but I like to use these jigs a lot. Um, going back to what you were saying, you know, three quarter ounce, just basic white. This is a Sea Striker Gotcha Bucktail. And this is pretty much what I threw the entire fall run on the North Shore last year, um, except for a couple places back west. Um, but when I was fishing out in Orient and, and that whole area on the North Fork, um, this was really what I used. And the fat cow jig strips are great because you just slide it on there. And it does give it a little extra wiggle and uh, makes it a little bit fuller body without that hackle getting in the way of the actual hook. But yeah, I, I find the hackle to be a good thing in those settings because it fills out that hollow spot, number one, and it gives it body and it gives it taper. Um, but again, it, and I've rarely seen this, um, is if you have really long hackles, you know, I used to buy hackles in, in like these giant bags. I don't want to say it was a pound of them, but boy, it might've, I mean, it was a ridiculous quantity. And then I would sort them and, um, for the inlets, that's where I would be using the longest ones and that I'd work my way down. But I was always careful, you know, you're using like six, seven inch strips uh, in the inlets. And that was usually never an issue that the hackles could possibly extend uh, beyond that. So, yeah, I don't want, the, I, I want the hackles, hack, I want the hackles. I don't want them going out near the end of the strip and, 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 and knocking, knocking that out. Now, something you had mentioned about the, um, uh, the deer hair is, you know, it's, it's buoyant and all that. Well, you know, I don't know if you're aware, but there's some huge issues right now with, um, the cost of, um, wholesale deer tails. Apparently the story I've got is that there were only two tanneries in the country. And now there's one. And now the wholesale price of the tails going to the bucktail manufacturers has absolutely skyrocketed. And yeah, so they're looking, um, at, at synthetics and um so what i want to show here now this is a prototype uh i don't know that you know so stanley at sns made this for me just to you know show me the hair i i don't believe these are being sold yet i i don't know anything about that all i know is he sent me some but you know you mentioned yeah that's that's buoyant but the synthetics are not buoyant and I, so I, the next video is going to take a look at exactly this bucktail and there's that, that jig strip you mentioned, um, you know, same, same thing there. Um, but boy, what a difference. And I'm not saying anything good or bad. I'm just, you know, putting it out there. This has very little drag in either air or water. This is very smooth. I think it, maybe it's a little more difficult to flare out, um, I don't know. There's a lot of playing around. I've asked Stanley since that um, making the, the trip with these to send me some um, of the synthetic, uh, just like the, the bucktails that we just showed, have those in synthetic as well. But yeah, very little drag on the cast. So the cast, it was funny. I started this trip and the first couple casts, I didn't, I wasn't getting hit. And I'm like, how can this be? Because I really expected the fish to be there. I was overcasting them because this thing flies through the air like a rock. I mean, it just, it's like, a, you might as well be casting a sinker because it's not just not, does it's, it it's well, it's not only, yeah, that's true. 
but also just there's just not a lot of resistance on this. And then when it was in the water, it was the same way. So a one ounce bucktail was really getting down very easily. So, you know, you could use, you know, the upside is it, it casts farther and you could use less weight. Um, and I, I think we'll be putting out the fluke bucktails with the synthetics because it, it's just going to become cost prohibitive to to tie those big fluke bucktails with real deer hair with the state of things right now. Now, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I have no hesitation going to the synthetics for fluke. Um, the, the, the gulp trailer to me is, is more important than that. Yeah. I, I want a hair jig. I want it to, you know, show a, a nice profile, but I don't think that the synthetics are going to be a problem for that. Uh, certainly I have a bunch of work to do striper wise to see what I think about, um, the synthetics, uh, versus the real hair for striper jigs. And, you know, my gut feeling is, is negative, right? You know, I've grown up all these years using deer hair jigs and yeah, but I have to say, you know, uh, if you watch the video, I, I did catch on, on the synthetics once I made adjustments and maybe that's, you know, what needs to be done is you just have to, uh, go with a lighter weight and, um, adjust your cast placement, retrieve everything else, just like any other lure, but uh, we'll see on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you brought that up about the fluke though. Cause I don't think it will matter as much if that's what you were getting at about the fluke, just because they're whole, you want it to hold bottom a little bit more. So if it is holding bottom and there's a little bit less flotation yeah. from, uh, from a deer hair, you know, I think it'll maybe even help the bite Right. Um, it, that it's going to take some testing and, and due time. You'll see. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to be able to, uh, there, there may actually be a, a positive there because um, instead of using four ounces, maybe, uh, huh. Instead of using four ounces, you're going to get away with three ounces. I can tell you right off, just by that little experience of, you know, one you know, hour or so of using the, the synthetics in, in a rip casting for stripers and feeling the difference in the drag, absolutely, you're going to get away with, with less weight. Um, so that will probably be a good thing. And like I said, you know, those, I know those fluke are keyed on the gulp because when I've tried to put something there other than gulp, um, you know, other artificials, uh, you know, it hasn't worked out. Um, so one thing you mentioned, you, you said that about the gulp increasing boy, that if gulp doesn't float, it sinks. So it, it, it yeah, it actually is, uh, a negative buoyancy, but uh, like everything else, all those soft plastics, the PVCs, yeah, if you drop that in the water, that, that floats. So they do add buoyancy. The gulp actually goes the opposite. The reason I, I've kind of, you know, put out that detail is I do a lot of red fishing in Florida where I'm almost always in two feet or less. So it makes a big difference whether, and, and then the weights on the hooks are like one sixteenth of an ounce. So whether I'm throwing, um, a gulp that sinks versus a soft plastic that floats, it's, it's like a, a big difference. So that's why yeah, I, I noticed that. Gotcha. Good to know. Well, um, so going back to some of those features of bucktails, um, you know, you fish from a boat, you fish from a kayak, you fish from the surf. So there's some different features such as, you know, things like the line tie that will make a difference in the presentation of your bucktail. Um, and, and can you go a little bit into about, you know, what you look for in a feature of a bucktail from the surf versus what you look for when you're fishing a bucktail from, uh, you know, I don't know, in like a rip from your boat? Um, all right. So, you know, let's keep it simple. You, you, can, you can never go wrong from from the surf with with this guy uh it's been around a zillion years and but what you're going to want to focus on is this whole bit about the hair density and and you know the bulk and all of that and depending on how you're fishing um you know maybe you don't want it that dense if you are casting into a heavy wind that bucktail you know this this guy if if you're casting into a 30 knot wind yeah this guy's going to be tough to get out there it's funny because, you know, you look in the bag and there's always bucktails of varying states, whether they've been worn down by fish or whatever it is. And, um, yeah, if I'm casting into a hard wind, I'm looking for a bucktail that's maybe not as dense. If I'm throwing into shallow, rocky water, I'm looking for a bucktail that's more dense. So I would focus more on on the construction and the hair density than I would on something like the eye placement from the surf. Gotcha. Okay. So go, also in, in terms of not only, you know, the features of bucktails, but when you're looking for stripers this time of year, you know, it's, 
second week of May, you're not out in the sound yet on your boat. Um, I, I think you said you're not really out on the surf in the sound either. So on the back bay side of things, what are you, what are some of the features and environments you're looking for um, that kind of uh, attract stripers this time of year? Outgoing water, especially on the South shore of Long Island, um, because the, that ocean water is cold. And if you're close to the inlets this time of year on incoming water, pouring in that cold water, that's generally not a good thing. Now, you know, there's always going to be somebody who says, oh, but I crushed them the other night on incoming at Shinnecock. Well, yeah, there's exceptions. But if you look at what the best strategies are, you, you typically kind of want to get away from those inlets. Try to get up in the back bays. If you can find, you know, well up in the back bay, some current. If you can especially fish, you know, the end of the day, the beginning of the night after the sun's been shining down on, on the water and uh, on the mud and everything else and, and outgoing water, especially, you know, that's something I'm looking for. And, you know, to, to an extent on the, uh, the North shore as well, because, Hey, you know, if you think about in the Greenport area, I saw it the other day when I was out in the boat, you know, I had like 54 and a half degrees on outgoing. And when I came back, it was incoming, even though it was later in the day and the sun was out a little bit, um, you know, it, the water temperature dropped because, you know, the water started flooding in. So yeah, this time of year, I'm, I'm, you know, looking at that water temperature and trying to fish more outgoing than incoming. Well, I, I mean, you've been fishing for only a couple of days now. What have you seen in terms of the bait the, in, this, in the places you've been fishing? None. None? Yeah, it's just going too hard, right? Well, no, even the, the two mornings I got out, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, I saw what I th looked like a big butterfish. Actually, it looked like a pompano, but it, I'm sure that's not what it was, but it was just one. And I tried to get my camera out to get a picture of him and he, he, he scuttered away, but it, might, it had to be a butterfish here. I mean, that's what it looked like. Yeah. And that was that's the funny. only, but it was one, you know, it was just yeah. one. I, you know, that happens, I think quite a bit. I I've heard of a uh, small Jack Crevalli has been being caught uh, on the South shore around, you know, Jones Inlet and stuff like that. Last year in particular, I think a few of them were caught, but you know, little ones, but it, it's funny how those things work their ways into our waters, even in the early season sometimes. Right. Because I caught a pinfish up in, um, up in the Porgy spot by Jessup's a couple of years ago. Uh, so that was, you know, that was strange, but yeah, the funny thing is, I've you know we've got Pompano down in Florida where I am. I've never actually seen them myself. So then to walk out, the first thing work, walking out into the water on the North Fork, and I, I looked at this thing. I said, "My God, it, it looks like a Pompano," but I'll just say it's a butterfish for now. <laughs> yeah. Going back to uh, you, you talked a little bit about your experience working with SNS Bucktails and and you know how you got into working with them. Um, and I know you have a couple of different styles or three different styles of bucktails, like the Smiling Bill, the Swing Series, and the Rattling Swing Series, So, uh, along with your fluke bucktails as well. So can you delve into some of the differences um, between those fluke bucktails and maybe those other three series of bucktails for striped bass and, and why the other ones will cater more to striped bass? Um, you know, it's it's funny. Let's see if I've, yeah, I've got one here. So on... Um... The, the first trip of the year there where I ended up getting 13 fish or 12 fish on the first 13 casts, I actually used the swing hook fluke bucktail. I mean, this is a, a one ounce. I was using an ounce and a half. Um, you, you know what? It was an area with some current with a little bit of depth. And I wanted to be able to get down pretty fast because actually in previous seasons, I'd use the fixed hook fluke bucktail, like a, basically like a spro. But I went to this jig. I mean, I like these. I mean, it's got, doesn't have hackles. It's got a decent amount of hair, but I'm going to be able to get down f pretty fast um, without a lot of weight. So I, I went with this. And you know what? This has got beautiful action, even with the swing. And uh, and yeah, I mean, there's there's a reason it's made this way and it's completely for fluke. But it's, you know, it's a good bucktail. Uh, you know, it, it works out. Uh, again, we, you know, we've gone through this one. This was, is, is always right. Um, these are really, like, mostly I'm using, and, and forget about it being synthetic. Let's just pretend it was real hair. Uh, Stanley made these up for me, uh, calls them the Gulf Series, down for Florida. But I use them for, like, snap jigging in, in rips here. Um, those very nice looking jigs. So, um, and the the point of that, and let's again pretend it was deer hair, is that you can um, like I can fish out 
in the rips out like Rocky Point, East Marion by me where it's 60 feet of water, three knot current. And if you're 10 pound test line and you can get down with a one ounce bucktail and, and, and snap jig it off the bottom, that's an application where you do not want all kinds of bulk because you've got to get down. You need to be able to stay down um, light and there's no trailer in that application. So, you know, that's a specific thing. Bullhead jig, um, you know, nice looking jig, no trailer. Um, yeah. So I, I, I've never really fished with, uh, the swing hooks. What, what's the advantage of a swing hook? Does it just give more action when you do have a trailer on there? Well, I, I can, like I said, that bucktail was made for fluke. Now let's, um, let's pretend that let's pretend this jig was, I mean, this is a one ounce. Let's pretend this is a four ounce fluke jig. So I'm going to answer this for fluke because that's why it was made this way. Mm. And you know what? Oh, this, this will work. All right. So you see where the eye position is on this. Now pretend this was, and I'll use Spro because look, Spro's a great bucktails. I'll use Spro as an example. Um, if I had one of my, I've got bags and bags of bucktails sitting here on the floor. Cause like I said, I just got here yeah. and of course I'm not going to find the ones. Oh, here we go. All right. So yeah, I can, uh, speak intelligently if i pull out one of these i guess sure yeah yeah I, I, I asked about that because i remember reading in the book specifically about spro bucktails and the eye placement the line tie placement is is very different in comparison to other bucktails because they're designed mostly for fluking and vertical jigging if i'm not mistaken right right so it's probably let's see how it's going to show here i should have had to put a piece of line on it but the eye position here is in the middle now this is a small uh, the fixed hook bucktail. By the way, the difference between the Spros and the s, &S Skinner bucktails is when you get to one ounce, we have a Gamakatsu 604 hook, which I really prefer, versus they have a, a nice hook for bass, but I don't care for it for fluke on the on the smaller bucktails. Gotcha. So that's why I was making them myself. And then it was another thing where I said, well, Stanley, if you can make those, can you make these too? And then, you know, one thing led to another. He makes pretty much all the ones I want now. And anytime I want new ones, but yeah, so we've got that, that center eye. So this is fine. This is actually perfect. If you're jigging, like if I'm in Shinnecock Bay, Marichis Bay, shallow water, and I'm using bucktail weights up to about an ounce and a half, that eye placement is perfect because that jig is, is laying level. It's, you know, look, fluke fishing is motion in the strike zone. That is the most important thing. And it's very easy with a light jig to get that nice, bouncing action and it's oriented correctly now if you bring that up to three ounces four ounces five ounces if you imagine oh and you know what i know i've got i think i've got one here or maybe not no i don't have them if if you take a like a, a four ounce bucktail with the eye here and you go to a like a pool where you can really see it and you try to jig that bucktail up and down at this orientation, it's like impossible because it's, it's, imagine that jig with a six inch gulp grub, which is what we use for fluke. This here is extremely hard to bounce up and down. You know, if you sit there in a pool and you rapid jig it, you're going to watch that jig is going to be going like this. It's going to be doing almost nothing. But if you shift the eye, in fact, you know what? I've got so many here. Let's see. Yeah, there's a fixed. All right. So now I've got a, it's going to make more sense. It's pretty sad that I have so many bucktails with, without having to get out of my chair because they're just all over the place yeah. here. It's a luxury. I right. say. Well, this is an, wow, it's, uh, this was a test hook. Huh. All right. So anyway, we're talking about the head, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's an interesting hook I've got on there. All right, so this is like a five ounce. Now, imagine if that eye was here and the, the hook was fixed. This, trying to jig that, forget about it. But if you shift the eye forward, then you start getting into more of a, a dipsy doodle because what happens is you pull up, it's able to pull up like this, and then it drops. So you end up with this. But now, if you make it a swing hook, the whole jig ends up with a very nice undulating motion. And I know this because I've got video in Montauk, like 85 feet down, five ounce jig, and you can just see that thing doing this, this kind of action. 
You can't do it with an eye here and a fixed hook. You just can't do it because you can't, you know, it's just too much to pull up and down. So that's the whole thought behind the design of this jig is shift the eye forward, make it a swing hook. So anytime I'm going with basically two ounces or more, I want that swing hook jig. Now, as it turns out, you know, in the beginning, I told Stanley, I said, well, I only care about them two ounces and heavier. But then he went and he made them three quarters, one and one and a half. And this is a one. And I got to tell you, these are nice, you know, they are nice jigs, which is why the, you know, a couple mornings ago, I started with that jig, you know, first cast of the season. And I went to that only because, yeah, geez, it works really well. And I had used it um, down in Florida for uh, Goliath Grouper and it worked really well there. So yeah, just they're nice jigs. That's great. So, uh, I mean, when you first, you said you got into, well, I think 12 fish on the first 13 casts of being back yeah. on Long Island, which is, which has got to be a great feeling, but what kind of, uh, what was the class of those fish? What were you looking at? The first one was like 30 inches, which shocked me because I, I you know, I was just trying to break, you know, with the first trip of the season, you're just trying to break the ice. You want to catch a couple of fish right. and, and it was like the first turn of the reel handle. And, I've got a fish on. I was just shocked. And uh, the first one was about 30 inches. And But then surprisingly, there were no dinks. There were no tiny ones in there. Um, most of them were, I would say, 23 to 26 in that range. There was like one more uh, that was probably legal. It was probably over 28. Um, but it was a surprisingly decent class of fish. But then the next morning, the, I caught like five and they were, you know, more like 20 inches, 22 inches. They were a little smaller. So do you typically expect for the North Fork, like that 20 inch class of fish to kind of be the, the first to really hunker down around the Greenport area? Oh. Well, yeah. It, yeah. And it could be even smaller than that because it's, you know, people, I think often forget because I'm always getting, I'm down in Florida. I'm always getting these emails. Oh, the bass are in the bass. But, you know, these guys are up West and don't realize that that water out on the North Fork, that's cold oh, yeah. it's deep it's cold it stays cold a, a long time and uh you know it, it's it could be five six degrees difference between even the south shore and the north fork and then when you run up west it's it's even warmer there so yeah early on it, it's going to be little stuff some of those uh maybe you know, most of them could be holdovers i i don't know yeah. Right. So, so when you're fishing the surf this early on in the season and you know, kind of the class of fish you're going to be getting into, what do you like to look at for in choice of rod and reel? Yeah. It's, you know, it's hard to beat like a, a seven footer with like a 3000 reel, 20 pound braid, um, you know, something, uh, you know, I use those tsunami classics a lot, not classics, uh, carbon shields. And I use the M down in Florida a lot. And I use the MH, uh, for this kind of fishing. That's so it's rated, you know, 10 to 17, whatever that's worth, but gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, now that you know that there's at least, you know, fish around the North fork and, you know, up to the 30 class, 30 inch class, um, June is notoriously a big fish month across the Northeast. And I would say, especially on Long Island and, and the Western end of Long Island. So what do you normally see on the East end around June? And, uh, what do you anticipate, you know, in the next two to three weeks leading up to that? Um, it's going to depend on bait and in the, the north the north fork bays it's going to depend on bunker and um so i need to be seeing some big bunker around and then i'm going to be switching over to uh pencil poppers and uh yeah so but it's totally bait dependent uh I, some years I, I get some decent fish in the bay and some years i don't um also i, I think it should be said you know this is really only my sixth season in the bay um in the spring because i moved to greenport from wading river in 2017 so um you know so, i mean six seasons isn't bad but it's uh i feel like i still have a lot to learn but it's certainly been you know when there's been i'm not saying that when i see big bunker i catch big bass but i can say when i don't see bunker i don't catch them so I, I know this is probably a silly question, but I have to ask you because it's something I've started throwing a little bit more. Do you ever throw metal lips on the East End? No. No? Okay. <laughs> I didn't think so. I figured. Hey, I'm not, look, I'm not saying they don't work. I'm not saying I shouldn't, that I shouldn't be throwing them um, or I should be, shouldn't be. Um, I, I just don't. And and it's just the whole casting distance issue is, is a big thing. Yeah. I... 
yeah, I don't probably should, but I, you know what? I probably, I'm using something else that probably works just as well. Right. I was going to say, when you get, when you get tactical with a bucktail, like you do, I don't know if you really need to be throwing the metal lips. I think you can kind of uh, find the fish. Yeah. You know what? It, it's funny. If all these years I find myself consolidating down to like two lures, it's, I mean, bucktail and pencil popper, you know, it's, uh, uh but also, you know, certainly the, um, the stuff like the hoagies, the sluggos, you know, the, uh, and, and after fishing, you know, Florida, it's just a couple lures for me. It's the spook and, um, jerk shads. So then when I come up here, you know, well, the, the hoagies and the sluggos are, you know, big jerk shads. So yeah, you know, use those a lot too. Yeah. Uh, what what changes for you as the season progresses with striped bass? Do you get on the boat more as the summer, you know, the summer months and the waters warm up and more bait comes around? Um, you know, I don't boat fish a lot for stripers. Um, I I try to stay on the shore for those. I mean, I I'll mess around a little bit, especially in the beginning of the season when I'm you know looking to catch some fish. But uh, I don't tend to boat fish much for stripers. I. I mean, look, we've, but especially as the season progresses, then I've got opportunities on both sides of the fork. You know, the fork is only a mile wide. So it's like having the North Shore and the South Shore right next to each other, you know, in a, in a way. So, I mean, June's a cool month where you can have them on, on both sides of the fork. And then by the time summer comes around, um, you know, you've, you've got them on the South side. I mean, that, now that doesn't mean that I won't go out in the rips and, and mess around a little bit. And, you know, I do enjoy that. But I'm I'm not the type of person who's gonna just go. All right, I'm I'm going out in a boat for stripers today, and, and you know that's what I'm gonna do. So, uh, last question or last couple of questions for you: Do you have any insight onto uh, on 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 the weak fish and their early arrival? Because it seems like they almost always show up with the bass, like uh, right around the same time. You kind of start finding those tide runners in the mix. Well, yeah, we talked a little before this about them being early. And, you know, I can tell you that, uh, you know, looking back, I can remember catching them or like April 19th and April 23rd. So to me, they're not early, but they were absent for so long. But back when we had weak fish 20 years ago or whatever, it might, it might be more than that. Whenever we had weak fish, um, you know, they, they did show up early because there were more of them. You know, you have to think when the population is large. And if you've got that bell curve kind of thing, and you've got, you know, at the beginning of that, you've got them coming in earlier. So I think hopefully that's what we're seeing. You know, when you're saying, well, the weak fish have shown up early, I want to hope that no, they didn't show up early. You saw the big, be- you saw the beginning of the run, and the run is going to be large enough that the beginning of the run is putting enough fish in the fishery for people to catch some. But I mean, if, Oh my God, last year in the Peconics, that fish finder, I mean, 40 foot thick schools. I mean, I, you know, I've got, I've got a couple of YouTube videos up there where it was just, you could not get to the bottom. There were so many weak fish. They were three to five pounds. And I, at that weight, I really have to hope that and think that they probably survived winter pretty well. And I think we're in for, um, you know, a real weak fish run. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I hope so. Yeah. I would- yeah, I'm very optimistic about it. I was going to say, I know a lot of people who, especially even in the Long Island Sound, I mean, the South Shore is one thing, but for them to be, you know, inundating the Long Island Sound, even into the fall, like well into the fall, um, I was finding them up there. And I know several guys, I know there's a guy, uh, a Captain Captain Stew of Northport Charters. Uh, he, he's got a lot, he's great about fishing with kids and he's putting kids on weak fish, which is really awesome to see, um, especially, you know, on top of the bass and fluke and all the other stuff you'll find up there. So um in terms of, uh, you know, as the season progresses, where can people follow you to keep up with your fishing? If you want to plug your YouTube or any social media and book titles and things like that, John. Um, yeah, YouTube is fine. You know, that's where I'm going to be posting stuff once or twice a week, depending on what I'm, you know, what I'm doing. And so that's always, uh, you know, just follow my YouTube channel. And I think that's the best, best way to do it. I'm not much of a social media person. I'm not sitting out there on, I mean, I am, you know, pushing those same videos out to uh you know facebook instagram but uh youtube's the real the real place yeah awesome well we'll make sure to plug your youtube here in the description for everybody to give you a follow if they're not subscribed already um and thank you again for joining this week john it's been a pleasure having you and uh talking stripers with you i hope you have some more time to get out there this week all right thanks for having me yeah absolutely take care john
That's all the time we have for this week. Thanks again to John Skinner for joining us to talk bucktail fishing for striped bass on Long Island. When fishing bucktails, there's a bit more of a learning curve than expected, but John's expertise should knock out some of the difficulties typically faced by beginners. Take it from me, it's very easy to get discouraged early on. Keep in mind some of the key points John made about weight, jig features, and buoyancy in order to improve your bucktail fishing, as they're one of the most productive lures for striped bass across the coast. For now, it seems like John will be hooking into plenty of 30-inch class fish on the bay side of Long Island's North Fork. Meanwhile, Tim Regan and South Fork surf casters are hitting bass up to 20 and 30 pounds in the surf. For all the Long Island North Fork surf casters, May has the potential to be a big fish month with a full moon coming up, so find a boulder or some open shoreline and get to casting. In the next week or so, we can expect larger fish in the 20-pound class to hit Connecticut and Rhode Island before they reach Cape Cod Canal, following schools of bunker up the coast. Striper Cup has officially kicked off, and if you haven't signed up already, you can still do so using the link below in the description. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on social media at On The Water Magazine. And check back next Friday for more striker season updates from On The Water.